we are so lucky to have them here at UCSC. They were at UC San Diego for 25. 25 years and pretty much built up the art department there. Well, there were five of us, Capro, the Antons. Um, That's Alan Capro. Yes. Yeah. And da- David Nelly Anton, Jerry Rothenberg. So, I mean, it was a uh, Sheldon Nodelman, the art historian, Manny Farber, the or, um, film critic, a whole bunch of us. Um, but, yes, we were the first. You were the first and and had this great career at UC San Diego. I'm sorry, we were the second. The first was Paul Brock. He brought. Yeah, Paul Brock came, he saw, he conquered, he left. Um, <laughs> And went to Cal Arts and did the same thing just as well. And then they had this wonderful career while also making uh, art around the world, winning many of the top art uh, awards. Uh, you were in Documenta. Eight, yeah. Documenta Eight. Um, they uh, work on a global level, and now they're here at UC Santa Cruz, and uh, they have uh, been teaching in the Digital Arts and New Media program. True. And (laughs) they um, also have just begun uh, a center, the Center for the Force Majeure. Force Majeure Studies, yes. The study of the Force Majeure. The study of the Force Majeure. Is that right? That's right. And then... (laughs) <laughs> um, they are about to open a exhibition here at the Cessnon Gallery, <laughs> February fourth. Sixth. Oh, Sixth. excuse me. I'm sorry. February fourth is uh, actually, I think, next Monday. February sixth yeah. will be the first um, opening night. First, they will be giving a lecture from four thirty to six o'clock in the. Uh, it's the uh, Professor Gallery in uh, Porter, right catty corner from the Cessnon Gallery. And then afterwards, uh, there will be an opening over at the Cessnon Gallery. And the exhibition will feature four of your works? Well, it'll feature the Book of the Lagoons, which is um, about a 45 image, handmade image. Yeah, the book, book. Of the, the book of the Seven Lagoons. And it's um, a distillation of a work called The Lagoon Cycle, which is a 360-foot mural in 60 parts, presently owned, not presently owned by the Centre Pompidou, actually, in the French collection. In Paris. Yeah. And we are able to um, see you here <laughs> in well, our little yeah, Santa you're Cruz. Able to hear. When they commissioned the work, finally they said, look, you, how many times can you show something this big? And we said, rarely. And so we made the book, uh, a number of copies of it handmade, so that you could get it, so to speak. So let me explain just a little bit to our dear audience uh, how the Harrisons and what kind of art making they they do. Uh, They are uh, a a pair of artists that that I studied myself while getting my master's in fine arts here in college. So I met them both first in, in texts and in theoretical studies. And then... They were brought here by Elizabeth Stevens. She uh, got you up here, started doing some lectures. Next thing you know, you're back doing professorship-type duties, <laughs> uh, even though they're post-retirement. and Aged, how's that? <laughs> but they're still doing work. Yeah. And so... So the art making began with Newton when he began as a young artist in the late 50s. Is that right? Early 50s? 40s? Really? I made my first life-size figure in 46. In 46? Yeah. 1946. He started out as a sculptor. 47, excuse me. But from there. And then... Uh, around the late 60s, 1968, would you say? Yeah. Uh, Helen, his wife and partner, and Newton uh, decided to work collaboratively and in partnership. Would be, uh, actually, exactly. In 69, 70, we made the decision and then spent a few years figuring out how. And you also made a vow that you would do no work unless it was to benefit the earth. Yes, the ecosystem. 
And so Helen and Newton, in a lot of ways, were pioneers in eco art environmentalism, activism, uh, through their uh, 40 years of, of working together. 30 years? Three, 43. 43 years. Now we're, we're heading for 45. We're heading for 50. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting the, to watch the trajectory of their work, beginning with, um, I'd say, for me, what was the beginning of maybe your eco art is when Newton started making Earth, and you made Earth in the museum setting, which no, was... I didn't. I made Earth first out at the in the university parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> which the, university is that? University of California at San Diego, in, 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 the, in the Pepper Canyon parking lot. I made Earth. Um, we had a studio there, and it was a 20-foot by 20-foot former garage that you, they kicked a poor nursery school out of. <laughs> and so we occupied it. And this is 1968? No, this was 1970. 1970. And the reason you decided to make Earth? Well, you know, we pose the question, what's the most endangered system in the world? And there are only three of them. Two of them, really, the water, the ocean, the world ocean, and the world topsoil. So we, so we couldn't make ocean, but we could make topsoil. And this was the beginning of what you call your survival pieces. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you went from making earth to... To what, is, what do we do with earth? We plant, we grow things in it. it gr things grow in earth. So you so, literally made a meadow. So we, no, we began by making... Uh, if, if, by thinking, well, how do people use it? Well, they grow plants to eat. So we began to grow plants. We so Helen, Helen grew the best strawberries you ever tasted <laughs> um, because I made earth way too rich for strawberries. <laughs> so in the beginning, who knew, who knew, you know? Like, right. <laughs> so we, we grew... Uh, uh, we had flat pastures where we grew plants that just stayed down, and then we had upright pastures where your beans and your peas and other things uh, climbed up the walls and climbed up the ladders. And we built, um, In the, museum settings. Yeah. yeah. Thereafter, we did, did, it's correct that we did hog pasture, upright pastures, um, Portable orchard, portable fish farms, that sort of thing. Then in, you went into aquaponics. Yes, and in museums. And mm -hmm. this was literally from 1970 to 1972? Yeah, in two years we knocked out a lot of work. Yeah. And these were works that you did all over the United States? I don't know all over, but we did... Um, <laughs> Where we did fish farms in Berlin. Uh, oh, in Europe uh, as well. In, in the Haywood Gallery in London and the New North National... And the... Uh, big gallery in, in um, Brussels. And yeah, then... The um, pa uh, Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels. Yeah. And then um, we did a, we did one in the L.A. County Museum, Orange County Museum, um, a museum in, in, in uh, Boston, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. We did hog pasture. And the hog pasture was just recreated in the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, the MOCA, just recently. Um, but with one uh, big change, the first time around, they didn't allow you to bring in a pig. The, yeah, the Peabody sort of owned the museum. They had a pig farm. So we called them up and said, give us a pig. And they said, not in our museum. Um, but L.A. Mocha said, sure, 40 years later, bring on the pig. Yes, that was Wilma. <laughs> that was Wilma the pig. And uh, for which you, I must say, uh, made a nice film of, and it's now <laughs> floating around the world. We get notes from friends saying, well, let's hear some more about Wilma. <laughs> Wilma was a great success. The She chewed her way right through the... See, nobody had ever seen what a hog does to a hog pasture. It roots. <laughs> so I'm thinking, myself included, so I guess we're both thinking it's going to chew up the grass. And no, she's, well, it's like this. She gets, we was a young pig, never had a soil hog pasture in her life. Teased her out of the little box she came in. She looked around, didn't know what to do. So I tapped in front of her nose the earth, and she went and sniffed, and then she knew what to do. <laughs> and she ate up, she 
she wrecked our hot pasture. It was wonderful. <laughs> Real well. Within yeah. a couple of hours, that pasture was completely done. How big was the, the little meadow pasture that you made? About 8 feet by 16 feet, something like that. And this was very similar to the original one in 1970. It was exactly the original one. Exactly. Even the same seed mixture. Yes, we called up our Shumway seedsman and, and got the same seeds. <laughs> Now, Helen and Newton, uh, I'm thinking that people that are listening to Artist on Art right now and wondering, okay, these are the Harrisons, they make art, but what's the difference between what you're doing and, let's say, a farmer in, in the middle of the Midwest, a pig farmer? How is it that what you're doing, or that you did 40 years ago, it, it is art? Well, it's like this. Um, what we did in a series of museums um, was um, make work that as an ensemble added up to the food chain. So we were thinking quite differently than farmers do. Farmers think in terms of good crops and monocultures. We were thinking of polycultural systems back there. Moreover, when we made a portable orchard um, in Orange County, it, which... It was uh, <clears throat> made with dwarf trees and we brought them indoors. But why did we make it? <clears throat> we made it because we thought all the orange trees in Orange County are disappearing. The orchards are being cut down, so we made an orchard for the museum that would stand to be the last years. orange orchard in Orange County. So, I mean, like... <laughs> and it was. <laughs> so, I don't know if we sound like farmers. How about we're storytellers of that kind? And how about we're social critics and of that kind? So, um... That's how... It, and we're storytellers about what is happening to the world around us and what we can do and have to do to make it a better place rather than the place that it is going to be if we let it alone. Let it become. And that is the becoming of the force majeure, which we have to acknowledge is the biggest combination of forces coming at us that well, we okay, have I should had define that. Um, in many well, Helen, millennia. We've, we've just moved forward 43 years, if that's okay. Yeah. And um, from our beginnings which were all these works in, like, 1970 to 72. But so, we, so let's just break that down real quickly, if, we, if you don't mind, maybe by decade. So yeah. your first decade was really talking about survival pieces on uh, what I'd say uh, you're thinking systematically, but you're thinking about these um, components of it. And then you moved into an urban um, environment where you were doing cityscapes and promenades and, and looking at the... The urban, urban ecology, yes. But, you know, we just... We're, right, uh, we're producing the backstories right now for a four or five hundred page book that I think Rizzoli Press will do. Um, and so in the beginning it did look like we did prophecy work and, and stuff like that in the 70s. And then we did the urban works in the 80s and then we did the uh, um, bioregional work in the 90s, 90s and global. But it was not quite that simple because um, we'll read you a piece we did in 1978 right now. And if we read that you'll understand that all this stuff mixes and it's sort of a mashup with moments of clarity. But um, we would not uh, make the argument that we're as systematic as that, although it was really nice when it looked that way. Um, the boundaries are porous. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, like, at the end of the Lagoon Cycle, 1978, we read a... We, um, we, read a, we, we wrote a text on a... First, imagine, we made a map. It was 8 feet by 17 feet. And this is in Sri Lanka, the lagoons. Uh, no, no, no. Please don't do that. Here. Um, read from there on. Um, what happened was we made a world map. Had to go to France to get the map because all of the maps had the, the states in the middle and we wanted the Pacific in the middle. And then we drew a, hundred, a, a line at the 100-meter mark to see what a what world looked like if the ice melted. And so by 1978, we were totally convinced that the greenhouse effect was upon us. 
with a profound question at the bottom. Helen will do the reading. Increase in heat, uh, decrease in ice. Increase in water, decrease in land. After all, the ocean whispered, I am the beneficiary of your garbage can, as you are the beneficiary of my abundance. And everybody knows that ice into water and water into ice are changes of state. Upon hearing this, we took a present world map and drew a probable world. It is said that if all the ice melted, the oceans would rise about 300 feet. So we drew a line as best we could at the 300-foot level and thought about how the land would shrink as the oceans grew. And the waters will rise slowly at the boundary at the edge, redrawing that boundary continually, moment by moment, all over, all together, all at once. It is a graceful drawing and redrawing, this response to the millennia of the making of fire. And as the waters rise slowly in the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, the Caspian in the north, the Baltic and the black, the ocean gyres will redraw themselves, as will the currents and the tides. And over time, gracefully, this rising tide will flow up every river that once flowed down to the sea, and each fresh water tongue will withdraw before the advance of the salt. Up the St. Lawrence, the Columbia, the Amazon, the Hudson, the Mississippi, the White Nile and the Blue, the Volga, the Don, the Danube and the Thames, the Seine and the Loire, the Rhone and the Rhine and the Garonne, the Ganges, the Congo, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Yellow, the Amur, the Irrawaddy, the Lena, the Potomac and the Snake, and all rivers, named and unnamed. And the floodplains that are farmed upon and lived upon will become marshes or swamps or bogs or beds for swollen rivers or shallow inland seas. And the tropics will become uninhabitable and the far north will become temperate and maybe more and corn and rice and wheat and beans and plantain, manioc and yams and all the grains and starchy roots known and unknown, named and unnamed will have to grow elsewhere than now. And most life, known and unknown, will have to go elsewhere than now, as parts of the eastern seaboard of the United States, vast parts, and parts of Europe near the North Sea, and much of South America near the Amazon, and China somewhere, and Russia in some parts, India and other bits of Asia, Africa, Polynesia, Melanesia, Australia, and Japan will join the growing sea. And in this new beginning, this continuously rebeginning, will you feed me when my lands can no longer produce? And will I house you when your lands are covered with water so that together we could withdraw as the oceans rise? This is a prophecy we made 35 years ago. And... Um, the key issue here, since it was for us a given, the waters would rise, the key issue here is the last four lines. Will you help me? Will I help you? The answer right now doesn't appear that I will help you and you will help me. And so we were in a conundrum. Um, and that's why we did the force majeure work to make now what Helen was referring to all these years later. And we did many global warming work since then. Um, what Helen was referring to was a, um, I don't know if we even have it here, with, is a, a manifesto we wrote. And the manifesto basically says, you know, um, we do have it, but we won't. Re Should we read it? Of course, but let me just tell everyone that you are listening to KZSE Santa Cruz, and this is Helen and Newton Harrison of the Harrison Studio. Well, there's this great force at work that we helped bring to being and speed up. It's called global warming, right? And our process of speeding it up is our in industrialization of all kinds. And so uh, when we were requested a while ago to, to see if we were willing to write a manifesto, we wrote the following. We, I'll only read part of it, it's pretty long. We at the Harrison Studio believe, as do others, although differently, that a series of events have come into being 
beginning in the time of Gilgamesh and before, beginning with the agricultural, beginning with agriculture and the first genetic manipulation, beginning with culture of animals and ongoing genetic manipulation, beginning with globalization 6,000 years ago with the salt route and later the silk route and later and later especially with science informed by Descartes' clock and with modernity recreating the cultural landscape and deconstructing nature thereby from the Industrial Revolution to the present until all at once a new force has come become apparent. We reframe the legal meaning ecologically and name it the force majeure. And we now have here at UCSC the Center for the Studies of Force Majeure. Yes, um, the In dean. Dean yeah, Yeager. Yeah, the, the dean you. helped us do this. Um, he, he, he told anybody who wanted to form a center, go ahead and form it. And I must say that um, having formed it, what, what, what are you saying, Holly? You want to read more of it? You don't want to stop reading this, do you? No. I would say... Okay, I'm, 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 can I finish? Do you want to read it right now? All right, you finished talking. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Only that um, once he formed it, then um, we were given, to do the experimentation we wanted, we were given the Sage Hen Nature Reserve. That has 9,000 acres. We formed a, so we're formed forming a scientific team to do the research. In the Sierras. In the, in the Sierras, about 20 miles. It's the high ground. It's close to the ridge, at the ridge line, about 20 miles south of Tahoe. And... Um, um, so we're proceeding with that. So um, it's it's part of a whole theory we have that we've passed all our tipping points, so we've got to learn how to adapt at great scale. So and you want to read some more? Do it. Helen Mayer Harrison. We of the Harrison studio assert, as do others somewhat differently, that the force majeure framed ecologically enacts in physical terms its outcomes on the ground. Everything we have created in the global landscape, bringing together the conditions that have accelerated global warming, acting in concert with the massive industrial processes of extraction, production, and consumption, that have subtracted forests and depleted topsoil, profoundly reduced ocean productivity while creating a vast chemical outpouring into the atmosphere, onto the lands and within the waters, that all together comprise this force majeure. We of the Harrison Studio are grateful for the opportunity to join this perilous conversation where the discourse in general is about time, money, power, justice, sex, politics, personal well-being, and survival. In many combinations and recombinations, attending somewhat to social justice, attending somewhat less to ecosystems justice. This discourse points to human consciousness every day continuously attending to itself with little attention to that which is not itself. Leading to in Leading to, to intrinsic, intrinsic value, value, switched for extrinsic value. With human creativity generating technologies that appear not to like that which is not themselves, sometimes becoming the reverse of their original intention. We of the Harrison Studio assert, as do others, as yet not many, that in the face of multiple tipping points, past and near past, from CO2, methane, to nitrates and nitrites, and more and more, all of these efforts and all of this work, altruistic from the best of people, greedy and mean-spirited from the worst of people, is better to be doing but not to, and than not to be doing, but on balance, insufficient, endlessly insufficient. You're listening to Artist on Art. This is Helen and Newton Harrison. I they are teaching here at UCSC, and they're talking about their uh, new center, the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure. And they've been explaining what the Force Majeure is. Just to step back a little bit and explain to our audience the type of art making that that you and Helen, that Newton and Helen, make. They they use installation. Uh, art and uh, dialogic art. That is, they 
bring discussions uh, site specifically. They go to places. They look at maybe you. You always go where you're invited. I, that's right. And only when we're invited. Only when they're invited, and they are presented with a problem. They take a look at it. They come up with some solutions. They invite the public to hear their solutions. The installation uh, many times has maps, uh, projections, uh, these things that you will be able to see at the Cessnon Gallery on February 6th from 4.30 to 6 o'clock will be their lecture, and then afterwards there will be the uh, Porter Faculty, at the Porter Faculty Gallery, which is D222 in Porter College. And then there will be the opening reception, uh, and and you use prose. Uh, a lot of times there's text accompanying their maps, um, describing the area. Sometimes the area in your earlier works would be a smaller area, such as Sri Lankan lagoons, uh, and then it became... Uh, continental in scale. They've done work for the government, British government, for the Holland government. Uh, you, you worked with the the Russians, USSR, I believe. With no, some I crabs. did not. No, they Who, never invited us. No, but you worked with the crabs. But we'll we'll talk. About that yes, a that's bit. true. There's so much to talk about. And um, but before we do that, I just need to say that. Broadcasting from the home of the Banana Slugs, UC Santa Cruz, you're listening to KZSC FM. And KZSC thanks Pulse Production for their support. Pulse presents the return of comedy great Paula Poundstone, Friday, March 1st, at the Rio Theater in Santa Cruz. Showtime is 8 p.m. Also coming to the Rio on March 2nd, an evening with author, lecturer, and founder of the Peace Alliance, Marion Williamson, speaking on the law of divine compensation, work, money, and miracles. And singer-songwriter Janice Ian on Easter Sunday, March 31st. Tickets for Pulse Production shows are available in advance at Streetlight Records in Santa Cruz and then online at pulseproductions.net. If you just got a new electronic reader, would you like some help checking out library materials? The Santa Cruz Library System is offering a free ebooks and more class. They'll explain how it's done on your Kindle, Nook, iPad, Android, or other device. All ages and knowledge levels are welcome. The ebook class will start at 10:30 a.m. Sunday, January 20th at the Downtown Santa Cruz branch. The class will be at the Aptos branch Thursday, January 31st starting at 3 p.m. For more information call 427-7713. And again, you are listening to Artist on Art. I am your host Nada Milkovich, and we are um, incredibly Privilege and honor to have Newton and Helen Mayer Harrison here in the studio to talk about their upcoming exhibition that will be again opening February 6th. And it's followed by, first they will have a public lecture. The lecture is in conjunction with the class that is being given by Elizabeth Stevens. The class is called The Earth as Metaphor. She has a whole slew of people coming, and the Harrisons are, are uh, uh, illustrious guests. Um, the class is Material Metaphor, Creating Meaning in Form. And then the show will be up for... As long I'm, as they want it. We'll be up actually till... Uh, Is it March? March 15th. That's or right. Seven, March 17th, I think. And in this installation, exhibition, uh, people will be able to see the work, the force majeure work. Well, they'll Parts be able to it. see... They'll be able to see the Book of the Lagoons. We read the last text in it, the Ocean Rising text. They'll be able to see two force majeure works. One is on Tibet... And the high ground, I mean, and the other is on the high grounds of Europe. And then they'll be able to see, um, I think, a video that we did of a work in Santa Fe called the Santa Fe Watershed, Lessons from the Genius of Place. Which shows how a work is proceeding and going gives you some sense into the situation of a work in the museum and... 